Before we get started, I want to tell you about my friends at Lean Solutions Group. Lean works with over 500 logistics and transportation companies in North America. You can describe Lean as a nearshoring company or a workforce optimization company, but as a customer, I describe Lean as a strategic partner who can help me win in a very competitive industry. They can quickly provide your company with top talent in operations, sales, marketing, technology, and business process outsourcing. They have over 9,000 employees in Colombia, Guatemala, Mexico, and the Philippines. Everyone is working with LSG. You need to. Check out the link in the show notes. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. On the Logistics of Logistics, I talk to experts in logistics and transportation, warehousing, fulfillment, supply chain, and of course, technology. And during these interviews, I'm always the one asking the dumb questions. I ask the dumb questions so you don't have to. Today's topic is scaling a freight tech business with my friend Mark McIntyre. Mark is the Chief Executive Officer of Princeton TMX, a software as a service based transportation management system. Princeton TMX is poised for growth, and my friend Mark McIntyre is a seasoned logistics industry executive who knows how to scale businesses. Mark shares his secrets to growth. If you want to scale your business, please take a listen. How's it going, Mark? Good, Joe. I appreciate you having me this morning. I'm excited to talk to you. I've talked to you before, but things have changed since we last talked. So, Mark, please introduce yourself and your company and where you're calling from today. Yeah, Joe, I appreciate it. I'm Mark McIntyre. I am the uh, CEO of Princeton TMX. Princeton is actually based in Fort Wayne, Indiana, but I'm calling from my home office today in Northwest Arkansas. Very nice. Very nice. So what does Princeton TMX do? We're a TMS platform. I I often say we are a single instant multi-tenant SaaS solution for shippers in North America. That that's a long, that's a long elongated description. Just think of us as a TMS for sure. Yep. So say that one more time. Single instance, what does that mean? One system configurable multi-tenants, so multi-customers using one system. We do weekly promotes, and those promotes will do enhancements, functionality enhancements, and every customer gets visibility and access to all that uh, on a weekly basis. So do you sell Princeton TMX to shippers or to brokers or 3PLs? Who's Who do you sell this to? We're laser focused on the shipping community. Ah, and I like that. I'm not saying the other was, I've talked to a lot of people about transportation management systems. I get when somebody says we work with brokers, I get when they say we work with 3PLs, they have unique needs, but shippers have unique needs and larger shippers increasingly want their own TMS. I think that's true. You think about TMS providers and and shippers and, and the conversations I have with those shippers a lot of times the conversation will always turn to visibility, uh, span of control, hands on the keyboard versus someone else's hands on the keyboard. A lot of shippers believe that it's hard to get a TMS provider to think about their business the way they do. If you're good at it, you can do that, but it's hard to convince them. Yeah. And I think one of the challenges, so when I was at a little third-party logistics company, we would call on some companies that had they didn't have a TMS. So when, and this, this goes back to 2008, 2009. So they looked at me like I was Steve Jobs. Mark, when I showed them our TMS, they're like, oh my God, this is crazy. And by the way, that's happened. I I showed somebody just before COVID what they needed. I said, and I had just, I said, you should have a TMS. And I had some screenshots and they're like, Oh my God, that'd be great. I was like, this is what the rest of the world's doing because they were spending a lot of money and they didn't have one. But anyway, getting back to it, we were we as the three PL were providing their TMS, and I remember how what we dealt with our customers, and I think it's the best way. Is that I want all your business, which means all of their shipments are in our system, which was good for us. But from their perspective, they're at a little bit of a risk if we stop performing. We would never have done that, but if we stop performing, and we say, and they say we don't want to work with you anymore. All their shipments were with us. All their information's with us. And if, by the way, if we went out of business, if we got sold, there's a million things that can happen to your providers. 
And it's a little bit of a risk if you don't have your own system. For sure. For sure. People think about it as a contingency plan. Don't put all your eggs in one basket to speak. But I don't think that's been our approach to Princeton TMX. We have, we've truly tried to partner with shippers and grow with them. Maybe their needs change if they need rail. Tomorrow they may need LTL, intermodal, barge, ocean. And we've grown with those shippers' demands. And that's how we've built our tech roadmap, quite honestly. Yeah. And by the way, there's a ton of companies shippers, I guarantee they didn't have a TMS. They had a nice ERP system or order management system. And then they worked with a 3PL and saw they have a cool TMS. And so does this guy have a cool TMS. Can we get our own? Because uh, we feel like we need it. We're going to talk about how to scale a freight tech business in a minute. But first, tell us a little bit about you. Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? Some career highlights before you became the CEO over at Princeton TMX. Yeah, I grew up in a small farming community in Northeast Arkansas. I give my parents a lot of credit for work ethic and humility and authenticity. I think those have been keystones to my success in my career. I went to school at Arkansas State University in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Graduated in three years. Really probably took me all of three years to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And my first job out of college was with J.B. Hunt Transport. I actually yeah, it worked out really well. I, I, but that's Northwest Arkansas, which is what I always hear. My sister told me one time she lived overseas for 20 years, her and her husband. And she said that he, he worked for a Ford Motor Company. And she said, wherever you go, there's Walmart and there's Caterpillar and there's uh, General Motors, Ford. But she said, all the Walmart people say, we live in Northwest Arkansas. And she goes, is that just Arkansas? <laughs> nope, it's Northwest Arkansas. So she said it's like a separate country, a separate state. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really a supply chain hub. If you talk to my friends at the University of Arkansas, which is just down the road. I have. You, this, is real, this is a real center for supply chain excellence. I started my career at J.B. Hunt. And, and by the way, J.B. Hunt is in Northwest Arkansas. They're actually about a mile from my house where, I, where I'm at now. So yeah, it's and Tyson Foods is here. There's a lot of great companies. Walmart's there. I spent six and a half years Ar- there. Ark Best is down there too, right? They are. They're in Fort Smith. Left J.B. Hunt, went to Penske Logistics, where I spent 11 and a half years uh, as a general manager. I also got my General Electric Six Sigma Black Belt certification there, which has been somewhat of a differentiator for me helped me really understand how to look at data in a different way. I left there, went to Transplace 2005 and was there for 17 years, watched the, the evolution of a great company. Uber Freight bought Transplace in late 2021. And what a story that was. From where we were when I began my career there to where we ended quite the ascension Left there, went to Emerge. Emerge is a freight procurement platform. It's been a, almost two years there. Learned a lot. Great company. Worked with a lot of shippers there. I interviewed you when you were there. You did. You did. And then earlier this year, in May of this year, I had a recruiter call me. And I'll be honest with you, Joe, I've had a lot of recruiters call me over the last couple of years, and I've pretty much waved them off. Um, but this one just sounded like something I should listen to. And uh, Princeton TMX is owned by the Stevens Group, which is uh, in Little Rock, Arkansas. So there was a familiarity with that group. Uh, Tim Minnick was the founder of Princeton TMX and the CEO uh, originally. I spent a lot of time with Tim, spent time in Fort Wayne, kicking the tires, really understanding the technology, but as importantly, the culture. Three months all summer long vetting each other. And it's just a great opportunity. Uh, it's a great company. I think we've got great investors and, and shareholders, and I couldn't be more excited to be here. Yep. And by the way, before we hit record, you were talking about scaling a freight tech biz. And how long have you been there? <laughs> so I'm on day 23. Yeah, I, I know there's been changes. So you have the founding team wanting to exit or maybe change their role anyway. And you have uh, an investor who said, hey, we want to grow this thing, right? They didn't buy it to to watch it dwindle. They want to grow. And you've been at a lot of high growth companies. In fact, you mentioned Transplace getting bought by Uber. Transplace was always one of those companies that did really well 
grew like a weed. But it's funny, their their name isn't Uber, right? So when Uber bought them, in a lot of ways, it was I, I don't know who was bigger and all that, but I, I don't even care. It it seemed like the merging of a whole lot of freight with a a name that is the brand is huge, and I know they've done real well so far. Yeah, brand recognition is huge. I'm delivering my 90 day plan tomorrow to the investors, day 24. And we've already accomplished a lot, but quite honestly, there's a lot to do. And I, I firmly believe the pace of the leader is the pace of the pack. And so I'm running fast. We've got some big, hairy, audacious goals in front of us. And a brand recognition is one of those. We've got to, we've got to improve that. And hopefully we will definitely do that. And, and you're helping me with that. So thank all you. All right. All right. You guys will be bigger than Uber soon. It's funny. You said you got to set the example. I'm moving fast. But what's interesting is years ago, I worked at the company and I was a founder led business and did real well. But I remember somebody made the point that the founder had other interests, right? And they said, yeah, but the challenge there is like the coach or the players, the players can't overcome the coach. So if you see a bad coach or the, and that's a lot of times I look at the leader like yourself as a coach. And if you can't get us out of this jam, if you can't manage yourself, we aren't going to be successful. Well, the first thing I would say is Tim Minnick has done an incredible job. Like on day one, when I announced myself to the organization, I led with what a great job Tim and his team have done here. This is not a reclamation project. This is absolutely great foundation. And so I would just start right there. Now, do I know what great looks like? I absolutely do. Have I been a part of some great companies? I, I absolutely have. And I think we're going to change a few things, but we're never going to change our culture. It's really good. Or our customer obsession. We will be obsessed with customer service. That's not going to change. That's the way it is today. I interviewed every employee. So for the first week I was there, I did one-on-ones with every single employee in the company. Every one of them led with, they love culture. They love the culture there. And then I went the next week and I met with our eight of our 12 largest customers. Every single one of them said they loved what we're doing for them. And they were all willing to do case studies with me over the next four or five months. So when you have employees that love the culture and you have customers that love your product, you can do great things. And I really credit Tim for a lot of that. Yeah, I know you're down in SEC country, so you watch football, I don't know, 20 hours a week, I'm guessing. And <laughs> I'm always impressed with the coaches. And there are so many good examples of coaches and how big culture is for and I'm sure it applies to pro and some other stuff, but the college culture, we're seeing Deion Sanders. They'll be lucky to get to a bowl game this year. They want, but they won one game last year. And you saw somebody come in with nothing more than the expectation that we're going to do great and brought in a ton of new talent, lost some talent. You have no doubt in your mind, though, that in a few years, they're going to be really successful. And we have so many examples. You look at Nick Saban, what he's done down at Alabama. Again, I, I hate him for it, but I admire him for it, too. But he, he's developed a culture. And I've used this example. When you think about what Nick Saban or any of these great football coaches have done, first off, they said, we are going to get the very best talent. And then we're going to make that very that, the very best talent. We're going to make them better. We're going to have world-class facilities. Our expectations are going to be high. Our leadership is going to be high. We're going to hold ourselves accountable. And... We've seen the other side of it too, where coaches go bad, where the coach has some personal habits that drags him down and he can't hold his players accountable. He can't even hold himself accountable. No, it's a great point. I'm an Arkansas Razorback fan, so it's really hard for me to talk glowingly about Nick Saban. But I will say this. He talks about three or four things very consistently. Talent, process, culture, and accountability. If you could write a book all day long on those four pillars and, and be wildly successful. And the playbook's out there. I think Dion's done a really nice job of uh, doing very similar work. I think they're going to make it to a bowl game. Quite frankly, I think their best two games are behind, or their hardest two games are behind them. And it's remarkable what he's done. And, and that really, you could pivot that into business easily, what he's oh, doing. Oh, yeah. There's a book. There's 
I haven't read them in a while. They're my Kindle, and I normally listen to Audible now. But uh, there was a book, short book about Nick Saban and his success. Another one about Urban Meyer and in his approach, and then another one about Jim Harbaugh. And by the way, there's so much similarity in the way these good coaches look at the world. A lot of it's culture. A lot of it's process. Again, I if you look at you look at like Jim Harbaugh, he coaches my beloved Wolverines. They don't do it as much anymore, but they used to grade out every drill. So you're doing wind sprints. They would grade and say, you are the number one wide receiver. You're the number two wide receiver. You're number three. And so when somebody would come in and say, hey, why aren't I getting more playing time? He says, hey, let me pull up the charts here and let's see where you're at. Oh, you are grading out as the seventh best wide receiver. That's why you're not getting in more, right? (laughs) You got to win that drill. You got to win that practice before you can talk about winning that game never rest on your laurels constantly assess everyone and everything we could make this a football podcast but i don't think people listen to me for that so we have to switch it so today's topic again is scaling a freight tech biz with my friend mark mcintyre before we hit record you said you have a 90-day plan you're going to soon talk to the board of directors i hope that goes well because i feel bad about this podcast being out there and then them saying that those are all bad ideas, Mark, but (laughs) I can't imagine that being the case, but you have a four point plan you wanted to talk about today. So what is that four point plan? What is the first point? Yeah. So as you mentioned, I'm delivering my 90 day plan tomorrow a week. It's day 24 for me. I'm already head down into it, but it's really got four pillars. As you mentioned, number one is employee engagement. And, And that's number one for a reason. I think that's incredibly important. And I want the employees there to feel my presence. I'll always be there. I'm going to be in Arkansas. They're in Fort Wayne. I'm going to be there as much as possible, but I want them to really. It gets cold in Fort Wayne. You know that, right? That's a huge reason why I'm uh, going to be commuting. (laughs) Uh, So that's first, employee engagement. Secondly is sales and marketing. I want to build the brand. I want to supercharge the pipeline. I want to get better in lead generation testimonials, case studies. There are literally 40 different things under that pillar that I want to get accomplished in the first 90 days. And it includes touching every customer, uh, which I will absolutely do. And then the third and fourth are finance. There's not a whole lot to that pillar except to make sure that we're built to scale. We've got the right, the right technology and the foundation in place. I believe we do. It's more of an assessment, really. And then finally, technology and product. We've got a tech roadmap, as everyone does. Uh, Our customers drive a lot of what's on that tech roadmap. That's one reason I want to touch every customer in the fourth quarter is to really understand where we're driving value for them and where we could be driving value for them as we think about building out the roadmap beyond 2024, if you will. I think the user interface and the user experience with our technology is second to none. I think it's tremendous. Let's go back and talk about each one of these. So first one was employee engagement. So you said you were already meet, meeting with all these. And part of that is you've got a brand new team, brand new CEO. And so you want to make sure all those good people that, you know, created that culture, that it does, the culture is going to change. You just want to, by the way, culture changes no matter what. You just want to make sure it's changing in the right way. But as you lose people and gain people, and as roles change, you have a ch- an opportunity and also a risk with the culture. Also, the nature of this is, and I've had this happen to me. I work at a company. I'm close to the founder, close to the boss. And then all of a sudden he's gone. And the next guy doesn't know me, doesn't know what I've done for this company. And if he doesn't learn about that, then I always feel like I lost something. I feel like I, I was... I was I was a star, and now I have to prove myself all over again. Yeah, when I go to the University of Arkansas and speak to Donnie Williams, senior class of supply chain majors. He's been on the pod. <laughs> he's fantastic. They often ask me about what's important as they're looking for jobs, and I tell them they need to do everything they can to assess the culture. It's incredibly important. I've seen bad culture, and I've seen good culture, and it really matters. And this isn't. Princeton TMX is not Mark McIntyre's culture. It's the people's culture. They are the ones that create and develop the culture. It's not mine. And so I want them to feel enabled, empowered, rewarded. We're going to celebrate victories in public. We're going to, sm- we're going to celebrate small victories. Set the circus down and do a victory lap from time to time. I've created a 
a way for them to give me anonymous feedback and questions that I'm going to share on monthly fireside chats with the whole organization. Uh, I want it to be very transparent. Uh, I want them to feel appreciated. I know they already feel appreciated in our one-on-ones. A lot of them said that they love it there because they feel appreciated. That's just something I need to make sure that we don't lose. And so employee engagement is incredibly important and protecting that culture is is paramount in my mind. Yeah, we've all been a part of teams where the leader was all in it for himself and it was all glory to that leader. And you're like, hey, this, how does this work for me? You, yeah. well, you take all the bows and I do all the work. I, I, I don't like that at all. And I think as you get older and you've experienced enough of that, you're like, I know what I like and I know what I don't like. And I'm going to try and apply some of that to my own leadership skills. So Joe, if I were to think about my own personal mission statement, somewhere woven into that mission statement is is something I say a lot and I really want to be held accountable for this. I want to be a credit maker, not a credit taker. That's really important to me. And, And so people are going to hear me talk about that. I like it. I like it. I know you'll do great on this. So the second and then probably the biggest challenge is when we talk about scaling a freight tech business is sales and marketing. So we talked for a long time before we hit record, <laughs> probably too long, but what are you doing to get that sales and marketing going so you can actually say we are scaling this business? Yeah. So under all those pillars, the sales and marketing probably has the most to do's underneath it. And it all starts with brand recognition. I've asked all the customers I've met with so far to help me with testimonials and case studies. They've agreed to do that. I'm going to really work with our marketing agency to try to get our name out there more. I think we need to improve lead generation. You should get on the top podcasts. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Um, I think lead generation is something to focus on. Historically, we've really relied heavily on uh, Tim Minnick's relationships and network going to conferences, there's so much more you can do out there. I walked in day one with a list of 100 targets. I emailed, on day 12, I emailed 100 different shippers, letting them know about the chains, uh, asking them to be part of their next RFP if they do one. So there's that. And then we're going we're gonna to blow out case studies, testimonials. So I think you're going to see our name out there a lot more. I'm so focused on this. It's not even, it's just... Remarkable how much time I'm spending on this. I'm going to tell you this, my own two cents on it, obviously. Not so long ago, if you're in this business and somebody said, grow the sales, you'd better get a whole bunch of young guys because they got to bang the phones. That's what we do. We bang the phones. I got a hundred guys making a hundred phone calls a day. We're going to be successful. And unfortunately, that got harder and harder. And when you're talking about selling MS to a shipper who's probably a larger shipper, who do you call? And is that really the right way to engage? Probably not. So increasingly, I always say this, if I'm looking for a new car, I go online, I do some research, I play around with it for a while. And then I say, okay, I think I narrowed it down to this model. Now, where am I going to buy it from? But that could take six months. I could, I'd be playing around with it. That's the same if I'm taking a trip, sending the kid to college, hiring, whatever it is. So we have to all realize that getting good content out there. And I'm not just saying this because I'm a podcaster, but this is good content. Hearing the CEO speak about what he wants to accomplish with his team, that's good content. Case studies, as you mentioned, those that's great content. If I can say, oh, I'm a retailer and I'm looking at a retail supply chain case study. Yes, that works for me. Oh, I know you work with lumber companies. If some if one of those lumber companies is a case study, it goes a long way to, to help the next lumber company say, yes, I want that. We can still make phone calls. We still got to get on calls and talk to people, get on the plane and fly and see them, get to conferences. But increasingly, we know how we buy by screwing around on our phones and on our laptops and our tablets. And by the way, I also notice this. I have Instagram. And I had to take it off my phone for a minute because it was wasting too much of my day. And I've bought from there. I go on Instagram and I'm looking around. And I go, oh, that's cool. I, I like this. I've made purchases, business purchases on Instagram. People are making purchasing decisions based on stuff they find on LinkedIn, on Facebook, YouTube. I watch YouTube more than I watch anything else. So the world has quickly changed from 
the way we used to engage with customers to the way we do it now. There's, there's no doubt about it. There's absolutely no doubt about it. Those are top of mind for me. Those everything you mentioned, very top of mind. On the very first day I was at Princeton TMX, I the very first thing I did was meet with the entire organization, and I asked them if they knew what a BHAG was. And a couple of people did, not everyone did. It's a big, hairy, audacious goal. And then I said, our first BHAG, we're going to triple the size of the pipeline by the end of the year. Now, that's very easy for me to say, very difficult to do, but we're going to do it. We're actually going to do it. It started with me sending out those hundred emails. And by the way, those weren't form emails. I sat down and customized every one of those, asking how people's families were, how their college football team was performing, like I know intimate details about all these people. And so I wanted them to feel that and not just say, oh, he's changed and, and here's a form letter. Yeah. I want to take a quick time out to tell you, you can now listen to the logistics of logistics on Wreaths Across America Radio. I'll put a link in the show notes. Wreaths Across America provides informational, inspiring content about members of the U.S. Armed Forces, their families and military veterans. Their mission is to remember, honor, and teach Wreaths Across America succeeds because of the generous support of the trucking community. Take a listen and please consider volunteering. Getting back to it, I went to TMSA, Transportation Marketing and Sales Association, down in Savannah in June. By the way, it's a little steamy down there in June. <laughs> I thought it was humid up here. <laughs> loved, loved it. It was a great conference. Loved Savannah. But there was shippers up there. And large companies, you would recognize the name. And when they were talking, they said, we get hundreds of emails per day, sometimes hundreds per week for sure. But they said a lot of them are form emails. And they said, and one of the guys said, I respond to every email that is unique. And um, I happen to know people who are starting to send video links and say, and sending video stuff and getting inventive. But also if I can reach out to somebody in a genuine way, that makes a lot more difference. By the way, I love LinkedIn. I sometimes say the cold calling mentality that we used uh, for a long time, just some of it just moved right onto LinkedIn where you just say, I'm going to, the amount of people who hit me up for, I'd like to move your freight or I'd like to be part of your, I'm like, I'm a podcaster. I only talk about moving stuff. And what it tells me is they couldn't take 30 seconds to look at my LinkedIn profile. They just saw logistics of logistics. I'm going to send that dude something. So, Joe, you, just as an aside, it's, I find this somewhat humorous. I would say since I took this role, I bet I've got no less than 20 messages in LinkedIn with people wanting to be my new executive coach. It's, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, you got to use my executive coach, Ann Holm. She's great. <laughs> and by the way, she's a, she knows football really well. <laughs> That's good. That's important. <laughs> so anyway, we talked about employee engagement, how that important that is. Sales and marketing. I think at this point, with all your experience, and I'll say the same with me, being open to the, all the ways you can triple that pipeline. You're right. You can triple it. It isn't easy, but there's so many more tools out there that we never had before. I'm saying, I've just said to a friend of mine, I can go to my website and tell you who visited the organization and the guy and the email. That is, that's like witchcraft for somebody. My gold. Age, right? Solid gold is what that is. <laughs> yep. The next one was finance. What are you doing with finance? How's that going to help you triple the size of the business? It It is. And honestly, that's more of an assessment. Do we have the right uh, foundation there? Are we using the right tools? Is it built to scale? My My gut tells me that it is. But I would be, I'd be mistaken if I didn't have that as a pillar and making sure we're buttoned up. You are the boss. You'd be remiss if you didn't know there's money in the bank. And Absolutely. <laughs> and Absolutely. I, guess, I guess if you have a new company, just change hands. They had some money to spend and they also probably had money to spend to grow it. <laughs> I don't know about all that, <laughs> but, but I do not, know. But not I as do. much as you want, perhaps, <laughs> but there's money to spend. Um, we're going to invest in the right places and we're going to grow and keep building on that technology. Yep. So the last and not least by any stretch is technology and the technology roadmap. So what are you doing and what's that? It's your fourth pillar. What is that? Yeah, I've spent a lot of time getting demos of the product, 
making sure that maybe I'm not a subject matter expert, but I really understand the functionality and can speak intelligently about it with shippers. In the past, I've sat on or led customer advisory boards. We don't have one of those here, although we have a lot of ways to connect with our customers and we're listening to their voice. And so I think those types of things really drive your tech roadmap. And those are questions that we're going to be asking our shippers. Tell me where we're driving value today. Tell me where we could be driving value tomorrow. And let's make sure it's on the roadmap or we, that we have thoughts around, plans around, all of that. I think the user interface is tremendous. I do think everything from order to cash, from a module visibility perspective, is there. As I mentioned earlier, this is not a reclamation project. This is a solid foundation, great tech. And, and all I want to make sure is that I'm staying ahead of the daunting task of emerging technology in this space. It's like keeping up with that's daunting. It That's the best word I can think of. And so we got to keep our eye on that. So earlier on, you mentioned modes. So I know Princeton TMX does has a rail mode, which most TMS, I don't think have that. Yeah, that's been really important to our growth thus far. We've got a lot of heavy industrial manufacturers, steel, building products, lumber, paper that really rely heavily on rail. And if you know a lot about rail, you know that telematics tracking visibility is not where it is in the truckload space. And so we're working to solve that. I talked to someone yesterday about using AI to help solve some of that. So that's pretty exciting. And so that's where we cut our teeth. But honestly, today we're also heavily invested in truckload, LTL, intermodal, and, and many of our shipper are, are pushing us to, to take them to ocean and barge, which is also important to them. And, and it's definitely on the roadmap. What's also interesting is when you talk about rail, I, I think you're probably like me. You watch those tr trains go by and you don't give it a second thought most of your life. But there's that's one one engine pulling 300 cars. Every once in a while, I used to think this is, I'd be driving down the expressway and there's too many trucks. I drive through Chicago. You go, God, I'm the only guy who doesn't have a truck here. And I used to think it'd be nice if all these trucks had their own lane. They do. <laughs> it's the rail. It's a great point. And when you see there, when you're in Chicago, there's a rail yard. And what's interesting is those 300 cars, it's a lot less greenhouse gases. So a lot of companies increasingly are interested in reducing their greenhouse gases. So rail is a nice option. It doesn't work for everything, what, but what it does work for is really a good solution. And again, for the for those industries, you mentioned lumber. Yes, there's a lot of things that work really well. It's not obviously going to deliver to uh, the final mile. That's not what they do. But what they do is, by the way, you mentioned you don't have the visibility. Trains more or less run on schedules. They are, that's, the train leaves when it leaves. And so when somebody says, hey, where do you know where that train's at? I know what time it left. I know what time it gets here. That's the same yeah. day. <laughs> Yeah, I had a feeling you were going there with that question or comment. Sustainability, emissions, all that has really become pretty much basic table stakes when a shipper is vetting a new product. Team reporting can help get a lot of the way there with mode conversion, shipment optimization. There's ways to report on all of that, but definitely taking trucks off the road, putting them on the rail, whether that be rail, true rail or intermodal is a great way to, to work towards better carbon emission footprint. And so that's definitely something on our roadmap. We definitely have the underpinnings of that now. My guess is most people are either either have that or are working towards that, but it's gonna move fast because every prospect I talk to and probably going back for the last 10 years has wanted to understand kind of where we were from a sustainability program standpoint. And you mentioned order to cash earlier. When I was doing value stream mapping or lean within automotive, we would do order to cash. Like how long from the time I sell the order to till the time I fulfill it. And for supply chains, a lot of times that stretch all the way across the world. That's got to be made in Vietnam and shipped on an ocean. It's got to go to California or Portland or somewhere on the West Coast, be railed over or goes to the Panama Canal, whatever it, it does, there's this long process. And you mentioned soon you're going to add that capability on your for your modes, which is nice for a shipper to be able to say, 
and the same system, I got everything. Because most systems aren't quite there yet. And by the way, probably because there was not even a recognition that was possible until really the last five, 10 years. Yeah, that's right. Exactly right. And I think it's nice to be able to say all my stuff's in one place, in one system. So I'm assuming Princeton TMX, uh, you guys connect to all the external Calm apps, but I guess they're platforms, like the visibility platforms and all that. Yep, we definitely can do that. Lots of integrations already in place. Talking about integrations almost daily, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. APIs changed a lot of that. It's easier now than it was back in the EDI or even before that. So yeah, integrations are easier now, but certainly uh, top of mind for a lot of folks like me. Yeah, my friend, Don Salvucci Favier was on my podcast and she worked at Manugistics and 3G, TMS, some other systems like that. And she mentioned something on my podcast and I didn't realize it until I didn't realize it is true until she said it. She said, we used to develop these TMS with the idea that these seven functions within the system, we'll do all those. We'll do them all really well. And she said, you focus on one system, then a function, then another function. She said, and before long, you realize the first function you're working on is no longer best in class. (laughs) And she says, now more and more, we still have those functions. I'm sure you guys do those very well. But increasingly, we're looking at our transportation management system and saying, how easily can you connect to my ERP? Can I get four kites in? Can I get green screens in? Can I get fill in the blank? There's a million different apps. And the best in class app from next year, we don't know what it is yet. As smart as we are, Mark, we don't know what it is. Someone's working on it and and you're going to need to integrate. Yeah. So it's going to say, Mark, you know what? I invented a blank and you go, oh my God, I need it. I need that right now. <laughs> I didn't know what it was last week, but I need it now. Put it in my system. And so I think that's increasingly important to shippers that not only be able to do those functions well, but also be able to take all those apps that I want to, that, I, that make the tool that much better. For sure. I look at WordPress. My website's on press. WordPress has like, I think 30 some percent of all websites are in WordPress. What WordPress does really well is they partner with a million other companies. So if I need a calendar function on mine, I, there's an app for that. I just, as a plugin for that. And I think that is a good parallel for what we're doing with transportation management systems is they used to be do everything for me, your own little world. We don't ever, we don't think of it that way anymore. We used to think it's the silver bullet that solves every problem. Now we look at it as part of an ecosystem, maybe the center of that ecosystem. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, I don't think it solves all problems. I do think it solves visibility, span of control, those things very well. There's some great products out there. We're trying to be the best. One other thing, and I I know you'll agree with me, uh, but I think it's interesting. I'm talking to more and more people who are doing the Internet of Things or what I IoT, or as I like to call it, the Internet of Trucking. And right now we have... When a truck crosses into a passes the gate to go to the dock, it could be tracked, right? I could have a sensor that says my truck got there at this time. And that could be pushed right into the TMS. And that is, in my mind, that's objective data. That isn't me getting, that isn't me at saying it got there at five or 459 because it had to be there by five o'clock. That's the system saying it got there at 505, right? And the he said, she said that we have engaged in for many years goes away. But also what happens, Mark, is now this isn't a problem that the transportation management systems created, but they uh, suffer with. Sometimes somebody says, oh, yeah, I can run that report out of my TMS. You can if all the data fields are filled in. But if they aren't, you can't do anything with it. Or if I... Or if I've went in and fudged all the numbers because I don't want to get in trouble. Yeah. You can run me a report, but you can't make, you can't know that it's right. (laughs) That's right. It's only good as information that goes into it. And the, he, the, he said, she said solving that problem. That's like solving world hunger. But that IOT can do that for us. 
We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> it's not going to happen overnight. I'm a little skeptical. I just, I do know the companies like yours will be able to pull data from all these systems. It's not going to happen overnight, but I, I just think how nice it will be when somebody says, I don't enter in what time it got there. You don't enter in what time it, the system said, this is what time across the gate. Boom. And also the detention stuff where you go, my, my guy waited there four hours. Nope. The system said he waited there 20 minutes. <laughs> so all of that is terrific. And incredibly important. What about on the front end when an appointment is rescheduled? Oh, yeah. And the debate goes on of did the ship, did the receiver push it? Did the carrier push it? Was there like, and by the way, if you're the third carrier that picks that up, whose fault was it that it missed? Was it the first two that rejected it? Like that whole back and forth solving for that is... That would be holy grail stuff. It's. I think that's. I think that's how. I think that's how companies like yours, the transportation management systems, are going to become even more valuable in the future because it's able to pick that data out. And again, we've got little bits and pieces of data now that gives us hope that we can get more bits and pieces of data in our system. You've, you've got to remove ambiguity everywhere you can. Yeah, and again, I would love it if. We've all been in meetings where you say, hey, I've got my carrier scorecard. I want to show you how well we did. And I used to, when I used to do those, I used to tell my team, I want you to be 100% open and honest. I don't want any fibbing. I don't want any, any white lies because we don't get better if we're telling white lies in those meetings. And there's a real tendency to get in that mode of, well, it's a lot easier if we just make everything green <laughs> and say we're on. Good luck going to a carrier meeting with a shipper and having the shipper scorecard match the carriers perfectly. <laughs> but yeah, that's, again, I can see you guys being that arbiter. And again, we're getting more of that. It's not going to happen overnight, but I can see that becoming more and more the case. I've had many, again, I've worked with a lot of people over the years. And I sit and I'll say, I want this report. And they go, we can run that report. And I was like, you can if all the data is in there, but is all the data in there? They're like, we'll see. <laughs> That's the, it's not the TMS's fault that no one put the data in there. Exactly. Anyway, enough of my blather. I'm going to summarize and I want to get your final thoughts on the topic because I've gone way over my time with you. So I'm talking to my friend, Mark McIntyre. We're talking about scaling a freight tech biz. You talked about employee engagement. You got to keep that great culture that you found and make it even better if you can. You got to grow that sales. You want to triple the pipeline by the end, end of the year. You got to make sure the finances are right. That's more of an evaluation. And then we talked a lot about technology and where the company's going. As you add more modes, as you understand those customer needs more, you guys will be even better than you are today. Final thoughts on the topic, Mark McIntyre. It's a daunting task to keep up with all that's going on in the space. I think we're well positioned to, to partner with a lot of shippers out there. I've got a lot of energy around this. I think our culture and our customers are really good, great, referenceable people. So I could not be more excited to be here. Joe, it's always a pleasure to be with you. I appreciate what you're doing to help me with brand recognition. I'll always be a supporter of yours. And so thank you for having us. Thank you so much for coming on my podcast. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. So I like to interview smart, interesting people like you, Mark McIntyre, people who are killing it in the space. Who else should I interview? You've already interviewed a lot of my uh, great connections. Donnie Williams of the University yep. of Arkansas. I would think about Shelly Simpson and J.B. Hunt or Jake Papa. And I would like to interview both of them. I could, Somehow Shelly Simpson fell off my radar, but we exchanged emails about it years ago. So maybe I'll beg her to come on. And who is the other guy? By the way, Shelly Simpson is the, what does she do at J.B. Hunt? Is she the president? President. That's a good job. That's a good job. And who is Jake Papa? Jake is a uh, newly minted chief commercial officer at Emerge. He was with them uh, literally from day one. Really great guy, uh, high character, high integrity, does a great job with the sales organization there. And I, I think he'd be a great guest for you. I would love it. I've talked to many people at Emerge and I talked to you when you're at Emerge. I love what they're doing. Guys, if you are doing anything in the RFP space, I think they're in many ways reinventing is too big, but certainly reinvigorating that whole discussion. And again, they're moving everybody they work with to quarterly or even seasonal 
RFPs, making it so much easier to do business with your partners. It's just a better way to do biz. Joe, before I leave you, can I talk to you about uh, how to find us on the web? And yeah, yes. To... <laughs> what I'll do is I will put a link to your LinkedIn profile. I'll also put a link to uh, your website and any of the links you and your marketing team give me. Yeah, I would love for people to follow us on LinkedIn. That'd be huge for us. I'll be at the Knit League Conference next week in Columbus. I'd love to see people there. We're actually at CSCMP Edge today. We have a booth there. And so... Well, we are recording 10-3, October 3rd, but this won't publish for a few weeks. Yeah. So I'll be in the conference uh, circuit. Love to see people. Yep. And I just was talking to you. I will see you at Manifest in February because it is nice and temperate in Vegas in February. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you so much for taking the time, Mark McIntyre. Thank you, Joe. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support's very much appreciated. Until next time, onward and upward. You have been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage with leaders in the logistics and supply chain community. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, hit the like button, and leave us a nice review on Apple or Spotify or wherever else you listen. Also, please check out our videos on YouTube and connect with us on LinkedIn. We're very big on LinkedIn. And you can also reach us on the logisticsoflogistics.com, our website.